Hey there, welcome back to another review, this time with the 1986 sequel, King Kong Lives. America's biggest hero is back, and he's not happy. Yeah, that's the actual tagline for this movie, and I don't know what it is with this franchise, with this series of Dino D. De Laurentiis produced King Kong movies, and they're just absolutely blatantly bullshit taglines. <laughs> Uh, but here we go again. King Kong Lives has another blatantly, blatantly bullshit tagline. America's biggest hero? Since when has King Kong been a hero? Did he save anybody in the 1976 film? Did, I guess he saved uh, Dewan when she fell uh, into the cell. But he didn't save the world or anything. He didn't save New York City. I wouldn't call King Kong a hero. Especially not the Kong from the previous film in this particular franchise. So he's back and he's not happy. Of course he's not happy. When is Kong ever happy? Uh, <laughs> Except when he's got a Jessica Lang. Then he's happy. But anyway. Excuse me, I just cleared my throat there. That's why I wasn't really... I paused there for a second. So, King Kong Lives is one of those movies that I have a soft spot for because I actually grew up with this film. Yeah, of all the movies to grow up watching, King Kong Lives. This is one of the first DVDs I remember buying is King Kong Lives. Uh, it, it's, for some reason, when I was growing up as a kid, I enjoyed and watched a lot of classic films like Ghostbusters, uh... Ghostbusters 2, Monster Squad, The Goonies, Top Gun, things like that. But I also was really drawn to the so-called disasters of cinema, like Howard the Duck, Return of Swamp Thing, uh, the Canon Films, uh, Alan Quartermain movies, and King Kong Lives. Now, I honestly like this movie. I, I've always liked King Kong Lives. I don't hate this film. I've never hated this movie. I don't think it's worthy of a 0% in Rotten Tomatoes. I don't think it's a 3.8 out of 10 bad on IMDb. I honestly think it's a bit underrated. I, I wouldn't call it a classic uh, like I do the 1976 remake. And I could see why people don't like the film. But I don't see why it's like one of the lowest rated movies ever or like one of the worst films out there. I don't really get that. I've seen much worse movies than King Kong Lives. And I've seen much worse King Kong films than King Kong Lives. I mean, people who think this is bad have never seen The Mighty Kong. But anyway, uh, King Kong Lives is a 1986 sequel that came out 10 years after the 1976 film, which in my opinion was way too long of a wait because technology advanced enough far, super far by this point in terms of special effects and things like that. So a man in a monkey suit uh, was not something that was really going to fly for audiences back in 1986. Um, and also the whole Kong mania had died down by then. I, I don't know why Paramount and Dino De Laurentiis did not make a Kong sequel in the late 70s or in the early 80s. Uh, in the mid-80s, that really wasn't the right time for this. But Dino De Laurentiis was really, really gung-ho about making another Kong movie. And he and his production company, uh, DEG, decided to finance this film 10 years later. And it ended up being one of the biggest financial and critical flops of the year 1986. Uh, it, this this is an even bigger bomb than Howard the Duck, box office wise, and critically. So, the movie costs about 18 million dollars or 10 million, depend depending on which source you look at. It definitely does have a lower budget than the budget uh, from the remake. In its shows, there are certain visual effects scenes here that you can tell it's a lower budgeted movie. Um, some of the stuff with the ape suits, uh, some of the, you know, for some reason, Kong looks different here than he did in the 76 movie, which is really weird 
when you open up the film with a flashback with scenes from the ending of the 1976 remake, you open up the film with scenes from the remake, and then Kong looks drastically different in terms of his design in this movie. So it's kind of strange. It's, it's definitely different. Uh, a different looking Kong. He definitely looks more ferocious. I have to admit, there's 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 more like this very. I mean, even the VHS cover art for this movie has Kong a, a, in like a black background with like these red eyes, like he's possessed by Zool or some shit. So, um, the film is directed by John Gillerman, who directed the 1976 remake of King Kong, and this was the last film he did before. Uh, he went, he kind of retired, he pretty much retired and he only did like TV and he did very few things on TV after this. This was his last theatrical film that he did. And I mean, it's not the best way to go out. He doesn't go out with a bang here. You know, critically, people weren't that fond of the film. Uh, financially, the film didn't do very well. So it's kind of not the best way for him to go out. But I don't think his direction is bad. I, I think he does a good job, just like he did with the remake, of shooting the sequences with the uh, giant apes in them, shoot, getting the most out of his settings. Y you can tell that this is a guy who knows what he's doing. I mean, he actually manages to make the whole ridiculous scene with the uh, surgery, open-heart surgery scene on Kong, he actually gives it a, cer a certain sort of gr uh, grandeur and uh, to it that I don't think would be there if you had a different director. So it helps that he had this guy who, would, who had directed all these kind of epic movies in the 70s, like The Towering Inferno and the King Kong remake, to helm this sequel, King Kong Lives. The film was written by Ronald Shusset and Stephen Pressfield. Ronald Shusset uh, helped with the story for Alien. He also helped with the screenplay for Dead and Buried. Um, and he and Stephen Pressfield would actually go on, I believe they went on to do Above the Law after after King Kong Lives, if I remember correctly. Um, yeah, they went on to do Above the Law. Uh, then they, then he also worked on, Stephen Pressfield also worked on Free Jack and, and uh, Army of One with Dolph Lundgren. Now... Stephen Pressfield, he mentions King Kong Lives as a life-changing, validating failure in his book, The War of Art, Break Through the Blocks and Win Your Inner Creative Battles. And he's, he's also written a bunch of other books and stuff like that. He says that this was his first professional writing job after seven years of try, 17 years of trying. That's a long, long time. And after the movie had bombed, he realized, excuse me, that he had become a professional. He hadn't yet had a success, but he had a real failure. So, yeah, I mean, clearly he wasn't really that fond of his work on it. But to be honest, I think he and Ronald Shusset, they gave it their best shot. They were written into a corner before they even started writing this script. Because the ending of the King Kong remake doesn't leave a lot of room for a sequel. Kong falls off the empire, the not the the twin towers. He falls off the World Trade Center, hits the hits the ground below. He's been shot to shit. There's really no reason to think that he survived, let alone thinking to think that he's in a coma for ten years. He's been in a coma for ten years. But I, I you know, they did their best. They tried to make it work. They tried to work around it. They added some fun stuff in there. They had the right idea by putting Kong in a different environment, which is something I think is very overlooked about this movie. This is the only film I could think of where you have Kong in a different environment other than Skull Island in New York City. So it's it's refreshing to see Kong in a small town. It's refreshing to see Kong in the Everglades. It's refreshing to see Kong interact with a bunch of rich folks, a bunch of rich guys who were at a country club golfing, and they managed to hit him in the nose with one of their golf clubs. Uh, golf balls, not club, uh, but uh, it's close enough. And it's, it's, it's fun to see him smash some yuppie teenager's car and be like, oh man, my dad's going to be so pissed. You know, there's a certain amount of fun to be had there. 
It, you know, he, he shows up in a small town. The small town has never had anything exciting happen to them in their lives. And so there are some teenagers there where there's a, one of them, He this guy, he's on a bike. And he, he asks his girlfriend to get on the back. It's like, I'm going to show you something you'll never forget. And he guns it and, and, and rides right in between Kong's legs, you know. Kong goes up and faces off against these asshole hunters and these rednecks who try to trap him. And there's even fun lines of dialogue, like uh, the military are asking these hunters, like, what are they doing? And it's like, you're, you're drunk. It's like, yeah. It's like, you're, it's like, are those guns loaded? It's like, yeah, and so are we. So, I mean, there's a certain amount of fun to be had with this movie. This is definitely, like, a B-movie. This is a B-movie. In my opinion, this is, like, a what-if scenario. Like, what if Canon Films made a King Kong movie? If they made a King Kong film, it would probably be a lot like King Kong Lives. And I think that's an awesomely bad thing. I think that's pretty awesome to have a King Kong movie that's kind of like a Canon Films uh, King Kong movie. So, yeah, I, I don't think the script is as awful as people make it out to be. I mean, they they did the best with what they had to work with, which was not much. I mean, they added some interesting stuff. I like the addition of Lady Kong. I think that was a different dynamic to have. I, I would have preferred not to have the scenes where they're looking at each other all googly-eyed, because that is honestly cringe-inducing to watch. And that is really lame, like extremely super lame. And I can see why people don't like the movie because they get to those scenes and they're all like, oh God, just shoot me with this like, Aah. Aah. it was just like, ah, like the campy, the campy, dumb, silly moments from the, from the remake are amplified here in the script. And, and I, and yeah, it, it does suffer from the same problem that the first, the film before this did, uh, with uh, its tone. It's a very weird tone. It's it tries to be silly and goofy with Kong and Lady Kong all like Google, looking googly eyed at each other and and courting one another and and so on and it, you know it's just dumb. I mean that whole scene. It, it's like that. It's like you have multiple scenes like the one in the 76 remake where Kong blows uh, Jessica Lang dry. You know, the whole... <sighs> like here, it's just like... <sighs> it's, 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 so, it's so bad. It really is. It, it really, I can't defend that shit. I'm not going to defend that shit. I mean, that's the stuff where people look at this movie are like, this is one of the worst things ever. And I can see why. That, that's bad. That shit is awful. I'm not defending that. Um, the There are some really cringe-inducing moments in this movie. But there's some pretty cool stuff, though, in this story, in this script. I mean, this is probably the most badass Kong has ever been in these films where it's a guy in a suit playing Kong. I mean, he fucks up the military near the end. Uh, he fights off these uh, asshole hunters he even like grabs one and he rips him in half and he eats one and swallows him whole and then picks out his hat and out of his mouth and throws it to the ground below so kong is is pretty fucking badass in this i have to be honest when he's not like fawning over lady kong but uh yeah it, it's 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 got this just weird dynamic it's such a weird movie it's a strange film uh but that kind of draws me to it i like these kind of strange off the wall offbeat movies for better or for worse and this is definitely one of those films i mean you got the whole operating scene where it's a giant artificial heart and they got giant surgical instruments and you can't help but laugh at it but at the same time i'm admiring the the effort that went into these sequences. I mean, especially the effects. I mean, can you imagine the prop guys? Like, their job? That was a pretty difficult job. That was a pretty difficult thing to pull off. To have a giant artificial heart. And giant surgical instruments. And, they, you know, they, they, they definitely did 
make a, cons- a very good effort. They gave it their best shot, and it shows. And for the most part, the characters, I thought they were pretty solid. Uh, they could have had a little bit more character development, some of them. I didn't really buy the romance between Hank and Amy. Uh, I didn't buy that. They also felt kind of useless. It felt like they were just getting in Kong's way for the majority of the film, uh, which isn't a good thing to have with your uh, human leads. But, yeah, I mean, the cast is not as strong as the cast from the remake. Not even close. I mean, you don't even have a someone the caliber of Jeff Bridges or even Charles Grodin. You don't have that. It doesn't, you don't really have someone that's quite up to that par but you have a couple you have some actors in the cast that do they do give their all they 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 try it it looks like they're having fun which i think adds to the movie and the the actor in particular that really stands out to me actually there's two of them that really stand out to me and the first one is brian kerwin who plays hank mitchell who reminded me of like a cross between michael douglas's character from romancing the stone and Crocodile Dundee. He's got that kind of vibe about him. And he had, he had so he was a fun character. I liked his character. It was nice to see him as the there's a scene later in the film where Lady Kong grabs him and has him in her arm in her hands and carrying him around. I thought that was a nice dynamic. It was different to see a guy in in the hands of a of a lady ape instead of, you know, the beautiful woman in the hands of Kong. It's it's a, a guy in the hands of a, a Lady Kong, and I, I thought that was a nice touch. Um, and I just wish that the film was more about. I, I honestly think he was a stronger character than Linda Hamilton's character, Doctor Amy Franklin. So I would have been fine. If it was just him, him trying to save Lady Kong and trying to help Kong and things like that, and maybe getting some action see you know action sequences uh maybe he gets in some fist of cuffs or grabs a gun or something and helps fight off the military because linda hamilton she clearly did not have her heart in this film she looked bored she looked like she was tired there were multiple lines where it clearly looked like she and sounded like she didn't give a shit uh, she delivered a very robotic performance for the most part. Every now and then she'll have a line where I actually bought it. But for the most part, her heart is just not in this production. And maybe it's just like, I went from the Terminator to King Kong lives. <laughs> you know, where's my paycheck? I don't give a shit about anything else other than my paycheck. And apparently Brian Kerwin's character, Hank Mitchell... Kerwin was not the first choice to play this role. The first choice was Peter Weller. And Peter turned it down to do RoboCop, which is the, the the best choice. I mean, it is absolutely the right thing to do. It was the right thing to do. But I can't help but imagining... I can't help but imagine how much better this film would be if you had Peter Weller in this movie as Hank Mitchell. Like, what if he took his character... You took his character and his performance from 50-50 and you put it into this movie. It's already a much better film because of Peter Weller. That's that's the Weller effect. So, and excuse me for my voice. I don't know what the fuck is going on here. I think allergies or whatever or some bullshit. And I'll get a drink of Mellow Yellow and see if that might help things. So yeah, Peter Weller in a King Kong movie. Would, that's a sight I would love to see. But... He did RoboCop instead, and uh, I can't really say that, wow, Peter Weller and King Kong lives over RoboCop. No way in hell. No way in hell. So, the other actor that I thought was noteworthy in this cast was John Ashton, as Lieutenant Colonel Archie Nebbett. He was such a fucking asshole in this movie. Like, that's all his character was. He was just this despicable shitty human being and uh he really played it to the hilt and did a phenomenal job playing this asshole military commander who's disobeying direct orders from the government and 
he just has this grudge against Kong for some fucking reason. And, you know, sometimes it's just, sometimes the simplest performances when it comes to a villain are some of the most memorable. And I really think his performance was fairly underrated because it was great to see John Ashton play a villain and he pulled it off. And I think he could have done that in other films, but you know, he's great in supporting roles as a good guy. Like he was in Beverly Hills cop and Beverly Hills cop too, but he's also a good villain here. Uh, so yeah, I mean, those are the two actors that really stood out to, the most to me. There's a few other people in the cast, but then, you know, they really didn't really have that much screen time. Um, and, uh, then you, of course you had the actors who played the apes. You had Peter Elliott to play King Kong. He did a fine job. I, I would say he wasn't on par with Rick Baker though. Rick Baker, you could tell he had studied hours upon hours of, and page, page upon page of gorilla, uh, information. And he really was so good at taking the whole, you know, the gorilla behavior and the gorilla movements and putting them into his performance. Uh, Peter Elliott would go on later in his career to do, to do ape things and play gorillas in other movies, and he would get better as as his career went on. But this is like his first big role as this type of guy in an ape suit type thing, and so it it definitely. There were some scenes where he he channeled it well, but there's other ones where it just didn't really feel like it didn't feel like a big gorilla, like uh, Rick Baker's performance did. Uh, George Yasomi plays Lady Kong, and I would argue that Lady Kong was actually a better performance in terms of uh, ape in a in a suit type of acting. And uh, the suits, though, I mean the 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 suits they look fine. Uh, the designs were different, though. I mean, the design of Kong in this is much different than the design of Kong in the 1976 remake. He definitely has this more ferocious, kind of evil look about him. I mean, he really does in this film. Um, and, of course, there are some scenes where he shows emotion, you know, like smiling and getting all googly-eyed over Lady Kong. But, you know, th th he does have this f very fearsome look about him. And this, the design is totally different than, than the design of Kong in the 1976 film, which is crazy because the movie opens up with a prologue with uh, that has sequences from from the end of the 1976 remake. But anyway, um, yeah, the Kong suits they're fine. They're definitely, there are definitely some money put into there in, into the suits, and it shows. There's one particular shot, effects-wise, that I'd probably say is the most impressive. There's actually a couple of them. There's a shot in Borneo where Lady Kong's hand is flying through the jungle and and is trying to grab uh, Brian Kerwin's character. And then there's a shot after Lady Kong has been captured where she's on a plane and she's in the back of this plane and... This particular scene, I think, is pretty impressive, a very impressive effect, because you see her feet, and then you see what looks like a giant-sized mock-up of Lady Kong that's inside the plane. And so the sh it's shot from a wide perspective, so you have all this these crowd of people around this plane, and Brian Kerwin's trying to calm everybody down. Don't take pictures, or freak her out. And you can clearly see that it's like this giant ape feet, inside you know that are sticking out of the back of this plane and it's a it's a pretty impressive shot the other effects i mean you can tell that there's some you know blue screening going on and it's a man in a suit type shenanigans and so on and miniatures and so and so forth um but you know you know, for the budget, they did a pretty good job effects-wise. I can't really say that these are some of the worst effects I've seen, to be perfectly honest. I, I mean, they're 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 pretty solid, for the most part. I mean, yeah, you can tell like when the baby Kong is born, and you can tell it's a just a guy, a little kid in a suit. But you know, there's still a certain charm to that for me, so it didn't bother me too much. 
It features a pretty solid score by John Scott. Uh, it it kind of reminded me of like a Jerry Goldsmith type of score, especially it reminded me of his music from Explorers, uh, especially sort of the main theme they have going on throughout the movie. Uh, there are some other nice uh, scenes, nice bits of the score too that are are used during action sequences as well. I wouldn't say it's on par with John Barry's score, not even close, but it's still a pretty effective score nonetheless. Now, the most effect the the things that I really like about the film are I, I like Brian Kerwin, I like his character, I like John Ashton as the villain. Uh, I, I like how ferocious and badass Kong is. I like the scenes where he's attacking the military near the end. Um, I like the stuff with the hunters where he tears them up and chews them up and spits them out. I like the whole dynamic of having Kong in a small town. And the climax, the finale, is honestly pretty damn effective. Now, I don't know what it is that got me, but it did. This ending, it's upsetting on one end because the film is called King Kong Lives and King Kong dies at the end of the film. So, uh... It's definitely upsetting in that regard. It's like, what was the point? It makes this whole movie kind of pointless. But, especially the title, you know, King Kong Lives, uh, but only temporarily. King Kong Lives, but he dies at the end of the movie. I mean, it's just like, he, I mean, you, you already, you brought him back to life. You gave him an artificial heart. He, he finds the love of his life. These asshole military men led by John Ashton just decide to keep fucking with him. He sacrifices himself to protect his wife and his newborn son. And the movie ends in in, in even more tragic way and fashion than the 1976 film did for me. Because, yeah, that's tragic. It's brutal. He gets gunned down, falls off the World Trade Center, and dies. Here he gets brought back to life. He has a second chance at life. It's a miracle. He, because... Even the heart transplant thing wasn't a, a guarantee at the beginning of the film. They had him in a coma, but he needed a heart transplant in order to survive any longer. And the chances of that ha happening weren't very good because they needed a blood transfusion as well from another giant ape. Of course, the, you know, the script has it so uh, Mitch apparently runs into a giant, literally falls into the lap of Queen Kong, of Lady Kong, actually, not Queen Kong. That's a whole other movie. But, so then there you have the, tra the, they transfuse the blood from Lady Kong into King Kong, and that brings him back to life. But, he gets brought back to life, finds the love of his life in Lady Kong, his son gets born, and he literally dies with his son in his arms. I mean, because humans gotta be fucking assholes, apparently. It's like, what was even the, what was even, uh, Ashton's motivation. What was his motivation? What was this fuck? What was the Lieutenant Nevitt's motivation other than I just fucking hate Kong? I hate this giant ape, this damn dirty ape. <laughs> and it just that just makes it all the more frustrating and all the more tragic is because Kong gets brought back to life and then he dies in a way that just, you know, he could have lived peacefully. And happily with his with Lady Kong and his son, and been there for his son. But no, an asshole fucking military guy has to gun him down, and it, it's just. And of course, he gets he gets his revenge and fucks him up and fucks up the military in an one last epic stand. But still, the end result is still the same. He dies with his son in his arms, in his hand. So imagine if this was you. Put a human slant on this. Imagine if this was you and you were shot and you had to get a, a blood transfusion from a person with a really rare blood type and, and a heart transplant and all of it ended up working out and you found the love of your life and you had a kid. You, you, you know, you were getting ready. You didn't have a kid just yet, but your wife is pregnant and maybe you're on vacation or something something happens there's somebody tries to mug you or whatever 
and you protect your your wife and and she's going into labor and you protect her just long enough so she can live and so your son can live and you get to have one last moment with your son who you can you can carry in your arms you hold your son in your arms and then you die i i mean that's that's pretty fucking sad uh so yeah um it it really did affect me like that and i guess i just cared i i grew to care for kong in this and i just really felt bad for him by the end of this movie so i i have to admit i'll be honest i i got a little bit choked up at the end of the film so yeah we humans man we gotta be we just for some reason we just gotta be assholes and I know this is a cliche according to people like Nostalgia Critic, like, oh, humans are evil, but it's true. We, we, so we actually do have some pretty evil tendencies when it comes to dealing with things we don't understand or we're not comfortable with or we're not familiar with. And King Kong is a species that's, you know, it's this giant big ape and we're not familiar with it and we're afraid of it and things that we are afraid of, we tend to be pretty evil. Uh, when it comes to dealing with it. So we tend to really have some pretty evil intentions. So, yeah. But I mean, I don't know what else to say about King Kong Liz, except talk about a few more of the things that I didn't like about the film. I mean, it's the typical stuff that I was talking about earlier. The lovey-dovey scenes, which just make me want to gag. Uh, the corny moments uh, uh you know the really corny lines of dialogue he's going ape shit you know it's just got there's just some really corny shit in this that even i can't stomach very well and i, I admittedly there is more action in this than in, in the, the remake but i could have still used a little bit more um and pacing wise i actually think it's it you know the it's fairly good, but I, I would have to say once Kong smacks his head on a rock, it slows down a bit, and I would have done something a little bit more in that area of the film. And first off, I think that's bullshit anyway, that Kong would fall into the water and then smack his head on a rock, and then that would really fuck him up. I mean, this is, I mean later in the film, he gets pumped full of lead and flamethrowered and all this shit. And in the 1976 remake, he got pumped full of lead by these helicopters and their miniguns. Oh, and, and John Ashton in the film was like, not even your Kong can survive that. I'm like, he just got a bump on the head. I think he could survive that. And it, it's totally anticlimactic because there's this whole sort of, oh, he might be dead. And, and of course you find out he's not and, and no shit because he just bumped his head on a rock. Uh, but... Yeah, that 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 whole scene I do have an issue with, and you have this whole moment, this whole subplot with Linda Hamilton trying to go to get up to Kong real close to fix his heart with this computer thing that she has, and Kong just steps on it. So I'm just like, what the fuck was the point of that? That was absolutely pointless. The one thing that you had linda hamilton's character dr a you know amy the one thing that she was she was useful for is completely destroyed and is out of the film and you're just like okay well that was that was pointless so um yeah and the romance between the two uh leads didn't really quite work either for me but um yeah those are the only problems i really had with it though for the most part i thought it was in pretty entertaining movie it's yeah it's got it's really bad moments but i don't think the whole film is on par with the shit that is the lovey-dovey scenes you know the the monkey love scenes i really don't think the whole film is as bad as those sequences so yeah i yeah i that's my thoughts on King Kong Lives. Uh, there are some de interesting bits of trivia, like uh, Peter Michael Goetz check for post-release royalties. 
because uh, he was one of the actors in the film. It came to three cents. He, he has apparently stapled it to the film's poster in his house, having never cashed it. Yeah, why would you cash three cents? Um, and according to the book uh, Creating the Filmation Generation, Dino De Laurentiis approached Lou Schemer of Filmation to develop an animated spin-off of King Kong Lives starring the son of Kong. Robert Lamb came up with some pretty wild ideas involving Kid Kong being able to change his size at will, apparently like Konga, and travel to different various planets, as well as underwater in a submarine made out of giant coconuts and bamboo called the Coco Nautilus. <laughs> Needless to say, Kid Kong never got off the ground. Wow, can you imagine that fucking plague? A film nation King Kong movie with Kid Kong and a fucking submarine made out of fucking coconuts? Like, this movie is amazing. This movie is spectacular compared to that concept. So, um, I'm definitely glad that didn't get made. Wow, holy shit. That would have been cinematic cancer. But anyway, I don't know what else to say about King Kong Lives... I've already probably given it a longer review than anyone has ever given this film. Uh, and I uh, hope you guys enjoyed the review as always. And I just, all that's left is for me to give it my rating and I'm going to give it three and a half out of five stars. Yes, I do think it's an above average film because there are some problems I have with it, but overall they, they do knock the film down. It's not on par with the 1976 remake because of those problems I have with it, but it's just a little step down for me because I get some of the same enjoyment out of this as I do with the remake. So um, I, I do think there's a good amount of fun to be had with King Kong Lives if you're in the right mood for it and you have the right mindset. This is a dumb movie. It's a big, dumb B movie. And if you if you go into it knowing that, I, I think you can get some enjoyment out of it. Or not, but... Uh, I don't, I don't know if I'd recommend it. I'd say if you like the remake, I, I would say check it out if you haven't already. But if you weren't a fan of the remake, you thought it was too campy, I would definitely say don't watch this because I don't think you'll like it. But anyway, thanks for watching, and I will see you guys later. See ya.